In June 2004, the new European Parliament had 732 members. A few months later, new Commission President José Manuel Barroso takes over with the year's major event enlargement, the key challenge ahead. Apart from the macro politics of the whole thing, the, the tiny stuff, the stuff where suddenly you go from 15 EU leaders sitting around a table talking, or EU ministers, to 27, and everybody wants to have their say. Scars in foreign policy opened up by the Iraq war a year earlier were still fresh. Opinions remained divided and Europe struggled to mean anything internationally. The EU is a front-rank global player, world's number one trade power, second biggest economy after America and world's second reserve currency. These all prove the EU is a global force. It's just that it doesn't have that political influence. Despite initial problems, the EU rode out enlargement and the integration of ten new members without crisis. The constitutional treaty guaranteeing the smooth running of the institutions was signed in Rome in November. Crisis struck for a few days in May, when first the French, then the Dutch voted no to the Lisbon Treaty. OK, the British will always reject everything, we know that. Um, and with the enlargement, maybe the Poles are going to be difficult, but the French and the Dutch to reject a fundamental treaty which is designed to improve the nature of the European Union? A lot of people just didn't see that coming. The crisis caught the Commission cold, and despite rumours it had a contingency plan, revealed no ideas for fixing the mess. But after Plan A had been rejected by the French and the Dutch, and we all said, OK, now you can tell us what is Plan B. And President Barroso and us said, well, I told you there isn't one. There is no Plan B. Budget failure that June under the Luxembourg presidency followed, despite hours of talks. The crisis deepened. J'ai eu honte. I was ashamed when I heard the new member states, all as poor as each other, saying in the interests of a deal they'd abandon some of their financial demands, I was ashamed. Juncker doesn't mince his words when he says he's ashamed. But he's right. You can't wish to associate ten new members who have suffered the Soviet horror without helping them, little by little, to get up to our standard of living. Faced with this double whammy of a political disaster, the Cowd Commission came up with a Plan D out of nowhere. D for democracy, dialogue, debate. Plan D, remember, can always mean disaster, desperation, despair. Let's say D for disaster. I don't think the Commission's ever understood how to communicate. You don't talk to people the top down by telling them if they knew better what the EU was doing for them, they'd love Europe more. It's ridiculous. And the council power trio of Blair, Chirac and Schroeder didn't give Europe its much-needed boost. I think they were overwhelmed by the events thrown at them and equally not as committed Europeans as François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl. José Manuel Barroso is no Jacques Delors either. The Commission struggled to influence the member states. Barroso is useful because he doesn't cause trouble. He's a sort of lovable dog's body for the Council of Ministers. Mr. Barroso is an excellent representative. He seems to me to stay far in the background in council matters, even in the group photos, which I hated, because it gave the impression of the Commission president trotting behind the ministers. J'avais tout le temps l'impression que le président de la Commission Dragging everyone out of this quicksand, the Parliament rode over the hill to emerge as a vital political force. It acted where others dithered. Parliament entirely rewrote the much decried service directive, negotiated the REACH chemicals reforms and later the climate package. Without a doubt, Parliament's coming of age in the last five years is a significant political factor. It proved itself with the Bockstein Directive, and it's proving itself today with the Financial Services Directive. Parliament was also the first to warn about over-deregulation of the financial markets a long time ago. The clouds seemed to clear a little. Following Parliament's lead, Barroso turned his back on crisis and proposed environmental investment as the future.
The Commission didn't play its role in the REACH directive and left the talking to Parliament and the Council. But I think it was a lot more proactive on the climate question, and it deserves its share of the honour in making it law. Member States also got new leaders, Angela Merkel, then Nicolas Sarkozy. Two clashing styles, but the Franco-German axis relaunched Europe forwards. On her own, Merkel wouldn't have lasted long. She needed a partner, but had to wait until 2007 when Nicolas Sarkozy arrived to see real change. Together they push the Lisbon Treaty through and lead the climate negotiations. Europe seems to reappear on the international scene. The world sees us as providing a lead in the fight to reduce the damage caused by climate change. We're taken seriously because we've been able to lead by example. The breathing space was short because last June Ireland rejected the Lisbon Treaty and two months later Russian tanks rolled into Georgia. Then the financial crisis erupted. But now Europe was speaking with a single voice. The EU negotiated with Russia and called the G20 together. The EU appears as a global force to be reckoned with, seen as a rampart against crisis. I think the eight months we've just been through has allowed Europeans to realise that the EU could be powerful. They don't have the levers of power yet, but they needed to be united.